Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Flying Sage podcast. This is your host, Michael Oliver. Before jumping into today's episode, I wanted to share a few housekeeping items and brief community announcements. I'm excited to share that we now have a partnership portal on our website that outlines the different ways you can get involved with the Flying Sage. Here, you can find more about our community platform and the different perks of membership and how to become a sponsor or affiliate with our community. The second update I wanted to share is for anyone in Vancouver. We are going to be hosting a big celebration on New Year's Eve. For an entire evening and into the night, we will join together for ecstatic dance, breathwork, cacao, and a sound bath. Early bird tickets are now available, so make sure to grab them before they are gone. All right, now for the episode. In today's podcast, we are going to be speaking with Dr. Trina Nguyen, also known as the Dharmacist. Trina is expanding access to earth medicine by training a generation of guides. With nearly two decades of experience in pharmacy, hospital administration, and medicinal research, Dr. Trina brings a wealth of pharmaceutical knowledge into the spirit plant medicine world. Previously a co-author on a Cochrane Review, she leveraged her background in systemic review and meta-analysis to develop a contraindications and interactions guide for pharmaceuticals and earth medicines, which appears in the appendix of the Manual for Psychedelic Guides by Mark Hayden. As a founder of Toad School, she created a decentralized training for aspiring guides, which establishes standards of practice to ensure set, setting, and safety in earth medicine ceremonies. With all that she has accomplished and learned, she will tell you, that her most important and cherished title is Mother. I consider Trina a good friend of mine and someone whose values I really align with. I believe her work is really important for democratizing transcendence, and I am excited for what she is building with Toad School. I first met Trina through the MAPS Canada community, and she was the first person to put 5MEO on my radar and in my consciousness, and for that, I am really grateful. In this episode, we discuss all things related to 5MEO DMT, a powerful psychedelic compound naturally derived from the Colorado Sonoran Desert Toad. We talk about Trina's background and how she created Toad School. We discuss dosing, community systems, clinical trials with 5-MeO, microdosing 5-MeO, whiteout experiences, and what it has been like being a pharmaceutical consultant in the psychedelic space. I hope you will pardon the dog barks toward the beginning of the episode, but please note that they do go away after the first five minutes. This was yet again a very fruitful and engaging conversation I'm grateful to have had. I now welcome Trina Nguyen. All right. Welcome to the podcast, Trina. It's such a blessing to have you joining us today. I'm really excited to chat with you. This has been a conversation that I've been wanting to have for a while now, and I think that you have so many exciting ideas and stories to share with the world. So I'm really excited for you to be here. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Michael. Excited to be here. Well, just the opportunity to chat because we have so many things going on, both of us, and we see meet each other. And it's like, just would like, I just like, I'm just so glad you're inviting me because we get to just sit and chat for at least an hour. Yeah, no, it's going to be awesome. So I wanted to start first with just, you know, I've introduced you already, but I want I'd love you to share a little bit about your background. So could you tell us a little bit about Trina? Who is Trina? <laughs> I I feel like you know, everyone needs to have their story down pat and so it's super important and here I am I tell everyone that and I still fumble a lot with my story because I keep going back and forth but but what version should I tell because there's so many versions of Trina so I think I like to say I'm Trina 5.0 version 5.0 because of course if you've heard about the if you've heard from the bio I mainly work with 5 meo DMT so I think I'd like to call this my final version, final Trina 5.0. And it it starts with the, the Trina 1.0, which is the Trina that started off wanting to, or just figuring out herself in the world. So I did what all parents want you to do, which is become a doctor. I don't know if your parents want you to do that, but a lot of, in my, in my heritage, everyone's like, you're not successful unless you're a doctor. So I tried to rebel and I did pharmacy instead of going into the medical realm. And, uh, but then of course, because I'm just a sponge, I just decided to do my doctorate in pharmacy once I got to the clinical role of pharmacy. And so I've got the pharmaceutical background, lived, gosh, I call it so many different lives, lived the, the, lived the life that, you know, the 
modern society tells you will help you be happy and satisfied. Had the house, had the dog, had the two and not half cars because you can't split that up. I had the two cars, I had the white picket fence and just realized that it's, it's kind of all a sham. It's like, no, that's not what's satisfying. The, what's really satisfying in life is a life of service. There's studies out there that even show that if you ask people who are ha- unhappy with their lives, what do they do? If they're sad, what do they do? And it was Japan and France that said, well, they studied three countries. It was Japan, France, and the US. What do you do when you're unhappy? And they they all, Japan and France, and or, sorry, Japan and Russia actually answered, oh, we, we, ser- we serve other people. We do things, we volunteer, we, we help others. And I guess what America says they do. I'm not sure what. <laughs> they shop. <laughs> they buy things for themselves. So I live that life of like, oh, I'm going to just buy things for myself. I bought all the interesting kitchen gadgets and just going on all of the websites, seeing like, what's the newest thing? I had like probably one of the first sous vide machines out there, like that kind of person. But having lived that life now, I know that there's such a much more fulfilling life out there, which is the one I'm leading now, which is in service of others. And also one that is a model that I like to spread forth to seven generations in the future. And my daughter is just at least one generation in the future that I hope to serve. So just to recap, yeah, it was school, academics, and then realizing that life was just like not as everyone told you said that would have you happy you know I was also going to all the fancy restaurants and going and drinking at all the bars and everything well in Winnipeg we called it bars but here we call it like lounges and and other spots but yeah then just completely decided after my experience with five and the OTMT that it was just a awakening it was a rebirth of just like what am I doing with my life And now, so happy, cannot even imagine this life that I live, just like waking up every day saying, how am I living this life with my dreams? So it was the, it was 5MEO that woke me up and introduced a new possibility that I never realized could happen. Well, thank you so much for sharing a bit more about yourself. And sounds like the 5MEO experience was really pivotal and shifting you into a new way of living and a new life for yourself. And so maybe before getting into more details, for those people out there who don't know, what is this mysterious 5-MEO DMT? What are you talking about? (laughs) It's, uh, gosh, if we listen to this 50 years in the future, everyone's going to know what 5-MEO DMT is, if I have any say in it. (laughs) So we'll speak to the people of the present. And so it's a tryptamine molecule there's so many molecules out there even like that are like a like a dmt backbone it's got like even psilocybin is has a dmt backbone and it's this molecule that has been isolated in our own bodies so we make it ourselves it's naturally occurring and it our bodies just love it 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 loves it even more than serotonin which we can get deeper into but it, it just works on our neuro, like our neurotransmitter receptors. It works in our brain. It creates epiphanies. Uh, it creates realignment. It can be meditative. It's, I mean, I'm, I'm, I feel like I, I sell snake oil nowadays, but fun fact is actually snake oil from the Chinese source actually was an amazing curative molecule and then when the people from I think the Americas somewhere tried to make the same thing out of rattlesnake oil it was what we call snake oil but the the origins of snake oil actually was curative and, and medicinal so anyway so I'm it is snake oil and it's like what source what, it is what, snake oil and I feel like I'm selling snake oil <laughs> so it's the original version of snake oil yes it's it is It's like a miracle to me. And that's why I will continue to just like praise it and share its accolades. And I, so yeah, we're very pro D pro five MEO DMT here. Right, Michael? Yes. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. I'm curious where, when were you first introduced to five MEO and what was that experience like for you? 
you mentioned already that it was pretty, pretty pivotal. So I'm curious if you might be able to share a little bit more about maybe like where you were at in your life when you first encountered it, how did it come into your experience? And then what was it like for you? Yeah. And if I might just, just add a little bit more reverence to the 5-MU molecule is it was, there's a long, there's a long history of it, not as long as say ayahuasca or psilocybin, but it's been, we're discovering more and more about it, about its origins and possible some, some origins of its use prior to what we, our modern day usage, but it's, it's mostly found in a Sonoran desert toad or what we most most of us call Bufo, Bufo alvarius, but its true name is Encilius alvarius. And so it, be, it comes from a toad. It comes, this psychedelic molecule comes from an animal and someone figured out that you could put it in a pipe and smoke it. And so I wonder what the term, you know, put in your pipe and smoke it is, but he did it. And that's how, where we are today is we have a molecule that's incredibly curative and yeah, it's a miracle. So back to, so I just wanted to provide a little bit more of like where 5-Amino and what it is. And, and uh, sorry, can you repeat your, your other question again yeah. about oh, what, what the first, my first time I experienced it? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit like lost for years, but I, it's been about five years ago when I experienced the molecule for the first time. There's someone I highly respect who's been in the medicine community for decades. And he told me that there's this, and the, the molecule kept coming up for me, it kept coming up for me because I've experienced quite a large range of, you know, self-proclaimed psychonauts, been working with psychedelics since I was 16. So I've been, been guiding people on and off since I was that age, uh, but I hadn't experienced this one yet and kept asking people like, oh, you know, where, where do you find a way to experience this medicine? And then finally that one person who I highly respect told me, Hey, if you're interested, you got to try this medicine and you got to try it with these people because I have not, I've not received, they're, they're my favorite facilitators, best facilitators I've ever witnessed. And I thought, okay, well, yes, always it's a yes for me. And I received it in a beautiful location along the water in a beautiful group setting, created a beautiful container of safety and consent. And that's where I received it. And I was kind of in my lowest of lows at that time. I, I was rattling between careers, rattling between, do I keep working in the pharmaceutical industry, which is where I, where I was, I was in pharmaceutical sales, which is, we all have our, our biases and prejudices about that. But I, I was in between going back to that role of, yeah, that's everything I need. It's how I stay stable in life. It's, where all of my expertise, my over decade of, of education you know, has, has like rolled into. And, you know, after that experience, I just, let's just say that even though I've had high doses of many other medicines, I finally knew what surrender felt like. I finally knew just what this trust felt like. And from then on, I just realized, oh, okay, I've got that, I got a, like, I got a tangible feeling of what trust is. And I know now what trust is. It's just like the biggest trust fall into the universe. And that's how, that's how it all started is the moment I received it. I just thought, okay, no more questions. Absolute wisdom has been downloaded into me. And I know that I got to start serving this medicine. Like what it, what it offered me was such a gift that I just felt as if, how could I not, you know, there's, there's just like, I had my partner, he, he had PTSD and he suffered for so many months where he, he understands why people take their lives. And when he had his first curative dose, he just thought, how could we be denying people these experiences? This is what a crime against humanity is. One of many that have been out there, but it's, it's a crime to be denying people something that we know can, can cure PTSD. Whereas like the next best thing is EMDR, which does help, but is it, it does it have the same rate of, of remission and cure as these psychedelics that were, that, that are out there. And so I just took it on as a responsibility in a way to say, okay, this is, it's helped me so much. I know it's going to help others. Mm. 
Hmm. Okay, interesting. Yeah, you mentioned PTSD there, and I'm curious, maybe before jumping into other questions, like, is that, I wonder if you could just expand on kind of the use cases a little bit, because you mentioned quite a few different things. And so I think that's part of what makes you, I, I'm assuming, so like part of the reason why you're excited about this medicine is because of how many different things that it can be useful for. PTSD is not necessarily one that I've heard as much of. So I'm curious, were you there in that story referring to at 5 meal with your partner mentioning that, or is that with other psychedelics? Well, we do know that there are clinical trials that use psychedelics for PTSD. I think that the there's the many psychedelics I believe have can either be put into remission or cure, or can highly alleviate the symptoms of PTSD. And in my own experience, I believe yes, five amino DMT can cure PTSD. I've seen, I've seen people do the questionnaires or surveys beforehand and after, and I've seen the dramatic results from it. I feel like as if it's just, we're waiting for the clinical trials, which take millions, if not billions of dollars to, 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 to build up. So it's, yeah. it's just from firsthand experience. I do know that yes, it's, it does alleviate, if not cure PTSD if served in the correct set and setting with safety. Okay. Always that caveat. Yeah, thank you. So moving on to another slightly different topic now, moving away from just, you know, explaining what DMT is and how 5-MeO in particular is used and what your kind of experience has been. I'm curious to hear more now about Toad School and if you could, yeah, invite you to share a little bit about what this is and let people know who aren't familiar with it already. <laughs> Yeah, so Toad School, and we're on our, I don't even know how many Toad Schools we've done, maybe 10 to 12 now, and it's been a completely iterative process. It all started, uh, so I decided to start serving 5-MEO DMT full-time since receiving it, I believe, about the call it five years ago, and I had many people who were as excited as me. They are like, how do I share this with others? And I'd say, yes, come sit, come learn. Like, let's, you can be my angel. I'll teach you everything I know. So I've had many people come in and do ceremonies with me. And I just, I just thought, this is great. I'm sharing it. But then after a few years, I, I have, I have a very adorable one-year-old baby. And so when she was in my belly and I was in the meditation, which is like a 10 day silent meditation, I also, as a background, I'm a practitioner of many, if we call it spiritual practices. I've done my yoga teacher training. I've done Reiki. I've done five Vipassana sits and I've done 21 days in a dark room to experience Montak Chia's practice of yeah, isolation and, and a, in a cave meditation. So I've, I'm, I'm a practicer of many spiritual practices, we'll call it. And so I was sitting in Vipassana and I realized that I am the bottleneck and I love thinking in systems and thinking how, okay, this medicine has to be shared with so many more people out there. And how do I then spread this more to others? And then of course you get these downloads, these, these whys, wherever they come from, but thank you. Came down and said, you know, you could, you can teach it another way. You could share it another way. And just this idea of well, it's about learning all of the upfront knowledge and how where it's from and how to interaction, safety, all of that. And then there's the sitting part, the experiential part. And even when you're having people, angels come sit with you, there's, there's, you're still not teaching them everything they need to know. And then I realized you can do a more formalized training of it. So that's what Toad School is, is it's a full day, like really, really long day. Actually, it's never a full day. It's just one for one part of it is a one day of all right i'm going to download everything i know about the medicine about the science of it about the clinical trials of it that have been coming out about the medical and the pharmaceutical contraindications what else is in our curriculum yes ethics integration we do a role play of a ceremony together we do even like a, the latest one i did an act out of like what what things what things you have to have muscle memory for to immediately act on, like kicking, screaming, and purging, and all that. And 
And then we also train a little bit on decentralization, which is another topic later on. So that's all in one day, right? You And then you get a booklet. And so you can refer to that. And also you have your community that's built. Like all of the Toast Schoolers, we create a pod of people who now we all, we all lean on each other to learn and to share and to also say, hey, this was great. Or, hey, I fucked up about, about, fucked up about this and I hope I can't use, sorry. I messed up about this and <laughs> thanks. And uh, like, hey, here's my learning so that you don't do the same thing in the future. And uh, so that's all baked in on the first day. And then after that, it's about, okay, now we start sitting in circle together and we get to actually know the medicine together. We keep practicing handshake and then they can progress to learning more and more about the hugs, which we'll talk about like all the different dosing tiers if we have the time. And then they can sit and actually host the full ceremony together. But it's just this, it's just, I feel like it's a springboard into having all the information you need and then how much experiential, in, like a practice to then have you feel ready to start serving the medicine. Cause it's, it's not, it's didactics and it's experiential and you've got your community to do the medicine together and to work with it and to learn and to also have the, like, the greater community to then ask more questions about. So that's school sort of feels like it feels like I can just keep on explaining but it's about it's, it's um in other words it's like a harm reduction course it's about you can order this stuff in Canada online and so why not sit and learn about how to serve it so that you can almost guarantee a peak experience you can also ensure that you're going to have less of the potential side effects that can come with it. So it's about trying to ensure the, the most beautiful experience you can and be prepared for it. Because we want to know how to how to sit with reverence with this medicine, you know? So there's training for MDMA, there's training for psilocybin. So it's just a, it's, it's a niche that I thought we needed a, to be filled, especially with something that can be as, as where it's as powerful as it is and it's as tricky as it is it's not just the pill it's not just a it's not just a tea you drink it's got a lot of moving parts and there's it's important to be competent in that as well so yeah it's 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 just uh, yeah, it's everything you need to get started on how to serve five neo dmt amazing and so I'm curious, like, if you might be able to share a little bit more about how the process has been going you building Toad School. So you mentioned you've had, I think, 10, you said now? Toad School? Yeah, at least 10. At least 10. Have, has, how has it changed over the course of you building it? Because obviously, when you first did it, you must have been like, whoa, <laughs> like, this is crazy. Like, this is my first time doing something like this. Like, I had this download of, of wisdom and intention coming to me, and I have this vision. And so now that you've been executing it, like what's, how has it been for you and how has it been for people? Like what's been some of the feedback you've been getting? And yeah, I'd be curious to hear a little bit more about, about the progression. Well, I, I think the people from the first Toad School would probably very, be very surprised to see how it's turned out now. It's become, and once again, it's about giving yourself that grace and the, the like room for, oh yeah, everything is a work in progress. I, so yeah, the first Toad School was just like, I'm very proud of it. Um, I had great support, but I also had some people who I've never met before come to it. So it was like vulnerable time of, do I even know enough? Do I, who am I to be teaching? Like I haven't done this for 20 years, but it's from even the first Toad School, people have, I've come back to it and it's been over a year now, a year and a few months. And I'm just so proud to know that people have been serving Five and Mio since that Toad School experience. Yeah, and I count myself as one of those people. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't sure if you were going to share like, yeah, I was part of Toad School. Yeah, no, um, I was. And it was a great experience. Yeah. 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 Thank and you. I, I'm not surprised to see that things are progressing because I think what you're trying to do is is so important in terms of democratizing access mm -hmm. to these medicines. I think it's what you're doing is challenging and and I, I, I sense that there will be challenges along the way, you know, trying to strike that balance. And we can talk more about that later on. But yeah, I mean, I was there for the first one and it was awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I had this dream like, oh, we could fit it all in like five, six hours. And I think people stayed till almost three in the morning. <laughs> so, but that spoke to just how excited they were about, I've, the feedback I'm getting is I've never had anything like this. I've never been to anything like this before. 
they completely believe so many people come and completely believe in the vision they they just love our just like every single part of toad school has been hashed out uh, and debated with my partner who is a genius. And so we've just like really put a lot of intention towards each part of it to make sure that like, is this valuable for people coming to sit with us because their time is valuable. Like who wants to come and spend nine to 10 hours of a weekend to just sit and learn about something? But yeah, so everything has been thought out through. And the first one was what, like, a great dance where we learned our steps together and every single time based on the feedback we asked for feedback at the end of every toad school we've just iterated on it and so like our finished product now we're getting to a point where we think that we could do this thing called toad school in a box because we're my focus has been vancouver to start spreading this molecule and i think based on all the people who've come out of toad school i think that it's becoming much more widespread this, this structured approach, this like safe approach, this consensual approach of how to serve 5 meo But I think once again, the world has, the world is a blue ocean. Well, the world is a blue ocean. It's a blue dot in the, in the sky, but it's just, we have, I would love for the opportunity to be there for others. And so one, one plan we have is, it's really exciting to me, but we may we may translate it to Farsi. We have someone who's a translator and they have connections. Maybe I don't, I don't know how much I can speak to this, but we do hope to spread this to the country of Iran who they, yeah, where we would like to target countries that we believe have been oppressed and been through some traumatizing experiences that this medicine, I think will be absolutely pivotal in part of their healing process. There's so much more to share again, but yeah, I, I just keep going. So I'll just keep going. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. I'm curious to ask you, what has been your greatest learning so far from facilitating these toad schools and seeing these things grow with your partner? Like as you've watched it expand and more people have access to it, is there something maybe like one overarching kind of lesson that you could take away that maybe surprised you a little bit or something that just like a general takeaway that you've had as a learning? I mean, everything could be seen as a teacher if you have the curiosity and don't take it in as like personal critique or judgment. Like just speaking to the medicine itself has been just the, the greatest teacher. So I received so many lessons with the medicine, being a server of the medicine. Uh, you don't have to be perfect to start serving the medicine as long as you have that ability to create that loving, compassionate space for others to to express and feel loved and accepted and cared for. So the medicine itself has been the teacher and then now spreading this to others, the, let's see what lessons I've, I mean, I've learned so many lessons in, in sharing this medicine through toad school, but I think the, I mean, I, I guess I'm just like still in this high vibration mill state because we just had a toad school just like, yeah two, three days ago. So I'm just like, oh, the feedback's been like amazing. And, and uh, they're just so grateful. And the, I, I think that it's, I guess the only thing I can think of is that I had like, of course, there's like feedback. Feedback is yeah. people share feedback in their own ways. People might only have five minutes and like, okay, they want feedback. Then I'll share something that I think could be a Delta. But like, of course, like when you receive it, it's like, oh, they only had something that they would change and they didn't say anything great about how amazing it was. So it's about, yeah, I think it's about receiving it all and realizing that actually any feedback is them wanting to contribute and share, like, how do I help make, help, help Toad School be better? So I'm, I guess I'm at a, for lessons about Toad School, I think it's, it's just that also, I just don't. I don't know all the answers. And when I share Toad School, we're so lucky because we get to be the evolution and the lineage of the medicine. So I, I share with them that I, this is just a one structure. And if you work with this one structure, but you can, it's flexible. You don't have to be rigid in the way it is. It's just, hey, this is how I, I've offered and I've seen great results with it. I'm very open to learning how other people serve it. and 
then if I think, well, that's really cool. Okay, I'm gonna add this into the script. Or I'm gonna add this into another possibility. So it's just staying, just staying open to the evolution that can occur outside of me, I think has been a great lesson because you know, it's really hard to, to change once you're like, yeah, I figured something out. But of course, how does anything evolve unless you're open to continually listening to others and saying, yeah, this is another way to, to evolve it. And this might work for other people and this might work for this other person. So I'm, it's a learning lesson for me is just staying open to receiving feedback and acting on that feedback. Like I'm, I'm more of a messenger than anything. I'm just more of a connect the dots kind of person. Mm. Thank you. I'm curious to hear a bit more, you know, you shared a bit of the positive kind of learnings and outcomes of Toad School. I'm curious if you would be open to sharing maybe some of your challenges that you've run into with Toad School and maybe expand expand on those a little bit. Yeah, um, there's even some, some people have like sent me things about criticisms and I, and I guess I'm like, I won't expand on criticisms, but of course, if I were to hear as a server and a carrier of the medicine, and I hear someone's out and doing one day training of how to serve this medicine, I would think that's preposterous. You know, how do you learn in one day? And then of course the stories keep going and the narration keeps going. And then it's easier when you've got an echo chamber of more people who are saying, this is, this is wrong. This is irresponsible. This is not safe. All of the dangers that can happen. But some people have come up to me as like individually and they, they ask me, they say, you know, can you tell me more about it? And that's when I open up the conversations. I, I don't want to go into a, a, into a firing range. I, I, but I listen and I, and the conversations I've had one-on-one, -on -one, they then understand about what the vision is. And the question first off is, do you want to share this medicine with others? Yes. Do you think that, you know, there's room for more people to be serving this medicine? Yes. Do you believe that, you know, with more experiential practice, there is a way to create a course on this? Like, yes. And there's just, it's going back to the fundamentals about like, yes, I think we can create a curriculum on how to serve five meal safely. And then I received their feedback. And then someone told me, well, well, I only do three integration sessions. I don't, I like, I like it's a minimum of, of three. And I say, okay, well then like, I'll, I'll add that in as like other facilitators do it this way. So I'm the, so yes, there's, I think the thing is, is for everyone out there who's doing anything new, who's disrupting status quo, you're going to get feedback because it's, it's creating vulnerabilities in, in just the system. Like there's something everyone knows, oh, we've evolved from, you know, these animals here. And then all of a sudden, wait, there was a flood and all these other things. Wait, this disrupts our status quo of what we learn. And like, we want to reject this new thing. And so that's, I understand that there is just a human nature to, to possibly reject something that is outside of their their way that they learn. I know most people have learned how to serve the medicine by following a facilitator for years. And I completely respect the other the other lineages with ayahuasca and with even iboga. Like they have a very clear lineage and a way to teach and learn. And I have high respect for that. But with 5MEO, it's just such a it's an open question. Mm -hmm. And so it's more about, well, what can we do to fill the space to add in, to just actually just try to saturate this, we don't want to call it the market, saturate the system of, hey, this is the safest way I know, and this is the most consensual way, and then let that, let it then all settle. So I'm, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a challenge sometimes with receiving the outside criticisms, but I think that once we identify that we actually are aligned on, on sharing this medicine with others, and it's the ones who actually come to me one-on-one, -on -one, have that conversation, I don't think at the end of it, anyone's ever said, you should stop doing it. So I, I, I just trust that once we, once they actually ask the questions, or if they come to a toast school, I invite all facilitators for facilitators to come. I've actually had facilitators who've been serving for years come to Toad School and they're super excited about it. 
So I, 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 anyone who is on the outside casting their doubts and casting their criticisms, I actually invite them all to come in first and experience it to then, then their criticisms actually are much more valid, to be honest. It's, oh, now you've sat in it. Now you know, now you can help me construct a better toad school, which I hope is the end point. It's not about let's shut you down. It's about, I think I have more to add now because that's what a community is, right? That's what building is together. So yeah. there you go. Thank you, Trina. Thanks for expanding on that specific piece because I do think it's important to recognize that there, of course there are going to be people out there that maybe look at like you say look at like a one day or or two day training and are like whoa like that's so different it's so short and and they're comparing it to other trainings out there and i think what you are doing is so different like i look around at the other training programs that i see and there's so many now they're popping up all the time and a lot of them are first of all yeah they're definitely a lot of them on average are a lot longer there's some programs that can last multiple years there's some programs that are weeks long and then there's, of course, like you've spoken a little bit to the experiential kind of coaching and mentoring aspect, right? Like for some plant medicines, there's this notion of like sitting with an elder for, for years, sometimes in, in some of these ayahuasca traditions for, you know, more than a couple of decades before serving. And so I think what you're doing is so fascinating and exciting, and it's just so important to, yeah, like recognize that there, there can be these different people's perspectives and challenges. And just like, I really appreciate the way that you meet those by inviting people to really come and have the conversation with you, because I think nothing is really going to happen or progress if people are just, you know, trying to pull each other down without actually understanding where we're coming from. So I really mm -hmm. appreciate having that open, kind of those open arms and open invitation for people to come and to actually talk with you about what it is that you are doing. And then on top of that, I, yeah, just want to emphasize the fact that you know, like you, you are trying something new. And I think the data that you are, that you collect from this is, is going to be so important. And at the end of the day, like that's really, you know, for, for, for people out there who are more scientifically minded, like they'll want to understand like, well, okay, like who, what's happening with these people that are going through toad school. And ultimately you will have access to that data and you already do. Mm -hmm. And you've already seen all these people that you've pulled through toad school, you've seen what they've been able to do. I'm an N of one. So looking at my own experience, I can, I can, I can definitely say that I think Toad School has prepared me to be able to offer this. And, and you know, given given also, I would say I would add, like given what I also knew already, like going into it. Yeah. And of course, there's mm -hmm. different levels of people that are coming in on it. And, but the other thing I really want to emphasize is like, and we'll maybe even expand on this now is like your approach with the finances too. Like you offer this, uh, my understanding is still is a Donna model, right? So yeah. For people that don't understand what that is, like essentially it's by donation. And so mm -hmm. that's a huge contrast as well to these other trainings that are costing thousands of dollars. And so yeah. what you are doing is, in my opinion, like democratizing transcendence. And it's so amazing to see. So of course, there's going to be people that are challenging that, but I just wanted to commend you for like going, being a bit of the black sheep, <laughs> you know, if that's the right <laughs> term. And yeah, kind of charting your own course and really trying this out because I think a lot of people, if they learn about this, like there's a lot of inspiration for other courses and other programs to um, think about how they could incorporate similar models, right? So yeah, thank you, Michael. I thanks for the summarization in your own words and just to highlight other parts of the offering that I highly, highly believe in. And let me just add as well, I think I mentioned it too, is Toad School, people who come to Toad School, we have a huge range. Like I've, I do surveys before they come in and it's, have you received it even? Like some people have never even received 5-MeO to practice facilitators for years. We have the whole range. So that's why I'm not going to require everyone to sit for months or for years. Maybe some people are just curious about learning about the molecule. We've had people who, who say, you know, thanks for all the education. I feel like I've gotten, like, in the eight hours of education that I've sat with you is more than I could have done in like a month of doing this all on my own through Google and Reddit and Erwin and Blue Light and all of that. So they now feel like, okay, I know this is for me or not for me. So we've had people who come who've never had experience who say, Oh, actually, no, I don't think I'm ready for 5-MeO. And it's like, 
good. I'm glad you have everything you, you need to say yes or no to the molecule, right? And then we've got like people who are practice facilitators, but I feel like I have a little bit of a selection bias when it comes to toad school because who wants to once again spend a weekend nine to 10 hours sitting with a molecule unless you actually have this commitment, this call to, I wanna sit with this medicine and I wanna learn about it and I wanna start serving for others. And usually there are people who already have served medicine for other people or at least have the curiosity to learn instead of once again, you can go on Google and just find out what dose you do and what tools you use. Those people don't come to toad school and they will probably go off and just do what they are gonna do. But I, once again, I just feel like I have a selection bias of people who want to learn how to sit with this medicine in a safe, consensual way. And they will then still stay curious about what are all the other resources out there, all the other books? How do I sit again? Like, how do I continue to learn more and more about different modalities, different structures and templates of, of like applying it to this medicine? So I'm, I just, I guess we just have to have this trust that we, we all, if we're curious and we want to share this medicine that we can be medicine carriers. And yeah, I just, I just, if it's just all held within only a certain amount of people and to speak to a little bit of the donation model, it's like my first experience cost me over a thousand dollars. And I don't think many people have that opportunity to take in a weekend away and to have choose between a car payment or rent or an experience that I don't know what's going to happen. There's a risk in that experience too, right? So the this is this is also why I do the donation model is because a truly democratize to democratize transcendence to allow access for others. It's removing the barriers, and at this point, I think that the barriers are. One major one is, can I pay for this? And another one is, do I have anyone I trust around me or do is anyone talking about it? And so I feel like Total School speaks to both of those major barriers is we, we serve a diverse, people have come and they're all different diversities, different ages, different income brackets, different education levels. And so they, they will create their own ripples to increase access of this medicine and then because everything's on donation model, I've received smiles, I've received home cooked meals, and I've received generous donations to help continue this practice. So yeah, that's, if anyone wants to add how to add more democratizing of this medicine molecule, I will gladly incorporate that into Toad School. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, before moving on to an, maybe another question, I wanted to just kind of use this as an opportunity to speak about the the community aspect again that you brought up. And so that was another thing that you slipped in at one point, mentioning how, you know, people who go through Toad School, they're added to the community that you have. And obviously with the Flying Sage, like that's something that we're super passionate about. Like we consider Flying Sage a Flying Sage, sorry, the Flying Sage a community. And I'm mm -hmm. really passionate about community building myself. And so there's a, a big parallel there that I just wanted to, to maybe emphasize briefly here. And, and that was just noting that like on this piece of challenges, like, noting that, you know, it is interesting that this model that you've developed is to help expand access to one of the most powerful psychedelics that there is, right? Yeah. Like mushrooms, it's one thing to microdose mushrooms or give people access to mushrooms because in small doses, it's pretty minor, even in like medium doses, it's like, it, it has a certain potency, right? But with five, like, and, and, and it's the same, I guess, to some degree too, because there's different levels. And maybe we can talk about that, the different doses, because they are completely yeah. different, but maybe talk about like the therapeutic dose or like the higher dose, obviously that's such a powerful experience that can obviously be pretty destabilizing like other psychedelics that are in higher doses. Like any psychedelic in a high dose is going to have some of these destabilizing properties that give it some of its medicinal properties. Like the fact that it can shake your consciousness up and allow you to have this window of opportunity to create new patterns and do all these things. Like that's kind of, it's like the benefit the blessing and the poison of it right in some ways yeah support, yeah right? so even yeah even to speak to that like the peak experience questionnaire one of the questions is did you lose control and that is a the, the, it's a positive in the questionnaire but it's just like i don't want to lose control. like most people will say like i don't want to lose control so it's it's yeah. it is a it opens up a range of possibilities when you go into higher doses i agree and you know like one thing i just recognize about podcasts now is like 
it's like a lot of like it feels like a yeah I love the back and forth Michael so please share more about your flying sage community building because I, I was just going to add that I I would love more insight and some learnings about how to keep building community because I since my lifestyle has been very nomadic I feel that community building uh, it tends to be stronger when that person who is usually the point person continues to be there. You're kind of the the like glue that binds everyone together because everyone's like, oh, I met Michael. Now I'm part of the Flying Sage or it's, it's, it's through networks and you're the major hub. And for me, I would love for our five MEO, I, I call it the five hive or the toadies. I'd love to continue to build community within them. But then I also recognize that there's different types of communities, right? For 5MEO, our 5MEO community, as long as they have someone to ask questions to, they can balance things back and forth and they know that they have that support within other 5MEO facilitators, maybe that's enough. I don't need to build, you know, there's like parts of me like, do I build something like what Michael has like, like done so well is like, like they like continue to like communicate together. And you know, there's like always comments and feedback and learning and, and sharing. Or maybe the community I have is more like a, like, hey, I just need an angel here. Or what do you think about this? I had this experience. And then that they just have that trust that they have the, like a backbone, or like a leaning, someone to lean on at all times. So right. I guess I'm speaking to like different types of community and yeah. Yeah, go on. I feel like I'd love to talk with you more about maybe strategies for community building, but I'll, I'll save that for another conversation with you because I, I just wanted to just touch on this point briefly and just highlight the fact that you do have this community support with Toad School and it does, it it helps to usher in this, which I think is a fairly novel idea around like centering your business or your approach around community. Like in the past, brands have developed and services have developed and then they've kind of added community on after the fact and like seen it as kind of a separate thing. But I really like the driven approach that you have and I think that it it is a different approach to what we're seeing with some other courses and trainings. And I think there's a big opportunity to really rewrite how psychedelic healing is conducted and what people think is necessary. Like, I just like to contrast it a little bit with like the clinical model, right? Like what you're doing with Toad School is promoting a certain type of access and not only like through your Toad School but also through the facilitators that will then go on to offer it. Like there's a, just, mm-hmm. there's just a certain energy that you are emitting and sharing with all these people and a certain value system, right? Which is in kind of contrast to some of what we see with the clinical approach, which is from what I've seen, like pretty expensive. Obviously there's some health coverage that can help with that in certain cases, but obviously most of the clinics that we've observed are with ketamine at the moment, but those clinics are going to be gearing themselves up already for psilocybin. So as soon as psilocybin is legal in certain places, those clinics are going to be off the first to offer those sort of things. And then it's going to get into the situation where there's just this, yeah, clinical approach, which I don't think is for everyone. I think there's definitely merit to it. And I'm sure for some people it will be valuable, but I just like to emphasize the fact that what you're doing seems to be paving the way for a new type of access, which is kind of distinct from that sort of access. And I don't think, I really hope that the psychedelic renaissance and like the the progression of sentiment in the community around psychedelics doesn't skew just towards the medical. And I think the med- because the medical is kind of part of the system and psychedelics in some ways are being tried to, it's almost like people are trying to really fit psychedelics into this old system, even though mm-hmm. the whole point of psychedelics is that we're building a new system, right? So I really hope that things like Toad School, and I hope in some ways the Flying Sage and other community-driven endeavors like that really help to paint a picture that there's this other alternative to this, the existing models that we have. I I really love the way you think, Michael, because you're back in my pharmaceutical industry experience. You know, I've always thought about systems and yeah, back then it was, I'm offering a product. It was a commodity based like offering or business. And then it was service. And what you're showing, you're, you're just highlighting is there's and beyond service now there's like a community experience offering which can wrap that all up it could wrap up the service and wrap up the, the like product per se but actually I think that is the 
the new third offering that that is invaluable because it it continues to feed and it's almost like grow on its own without having to have a salesperson behind it continually calling you or pushing something it's like no I keep getting fed by that community so I I love that insight about it's almost like the new evolution of the service model which is like the community community model and I'm gosh I had so many things to say and now I'm lost okay. for for that but they might come back to you yeah they, can you give me like a calls like a just like a really brief like what was a the main point being just like making sure that people are aware that there's different options. And I really hope that the emergence of a psychedelic school mainstream, that we don't just like pigeonhole ourselves into this, this existing system that we have. And like, we don't just try and yes. force. Yes, the, yes, the yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And sorry, I got excited. Like, I remember now the, I, I think that there is definitely a place for the medical model. I think that there wouldn't be access to these medicines had it not been for that clinical approach, having someone who is yeah, either a psychologist or a therapist sit there because there's a range of people. So it's having that, that the MAPS model, the ketamine model, it, it's like, oh, it's safe. And then that actually even paves the way for other possibilities, which then is the, oh, now there's, well, as we know, there's underground workers who are most likely have a therapy background or some form of background and then decided to then spill into the realm of psychedelics. And then there's the, hey, well, I, I just want to go out with my friends to a cabin and have this experience. As long as I have access and information on how I can keep it safe, like usually low doses of psilocybin has not been met with challenging experiences. As long as you keep it below, some sources say two, some sources say three, has, isn't met with challenging experience like okay well I can do I can go low and, and have a great experience out in the you know in a cabin in the woods with my friends so I, I I think that yes the clinical model is paving the way for more access and I think that I, I like the thought that you said about like trying to, to fit this square into a a round around like the square peg into a round hole which is yeah I, I, I hope we get to rethink the model as well like it doesn't have to be in a sterile setting. I hope that at least we've got like a comfortable spot where people feel like they're safe and not being like, you know, with their pad and people are just like observing you like you're a, a subject of a, of a study. And that's that's the challenge I think that the the medical or we'll call it traditional, I don't even call it traditional, but the we'll call it traditional model is that they're not accustomed to doing a one-time treatment and then letting them go off. And I think that that's, there's just, there, I hope that the traditional model is really connecting with the underground model to ask them, how do you serve? What have you figured out to then continually feed into, into both how to support all people receiving this medicine? Just because I, yeah, I've, I've heard of stories, but I'm really, really glad what I'm hearing is that we're all improving together is all. I will just leave it at that. Perfect. Thank you, Trina. Next question I had for you was moving into more of the technical logistical aspects of the work that you've been talking about. How does one use 5-MeO DMT or maybe what would be your recommended or suggested way to use it? Hmm. Well, I suggest always dive with a buddy because you don't go scuba diving without, you know, anyone or free diving without a, a buddy. And uh, make sure first and foremost that you feel safe wherever you are. So you feel safe with the person that you're with. So set setting, and then you also know what dosage to use. So you can find it all over the internet, but there, there's a, there we're getting much and much more polished with how to do the different levels. But I think if, if someone were to do it at home, I think play around with the lower doses at first. I think that the lower doses have this beautiful energetic, like it just shakes out some of the blockages and then like I did 30 days of low dose in a row just to see like, hey, can I create a microdosing protocol with this? And in fact, yes, you can. And many people have shared with me that when they they've joined my little my little test bunny group of daily microdosing, that they were like, I felt amazing. Felt like I've been meditating for for like days and hours. I just have this different way I react 
more so I respond to stimuli instead of reacting to it. So if anyone were to try 5-MeO at home, there's always time for a peak experience, but I think you can, there's just such beauty in the low doses that I think play around with the low doses. If you can, and you have a very, very accurate scale, which I highly recommend, ones that can, like a gem scale that can measure in the milligrams, or at least like, this, and use a tiny scoop too. Like why not just use as many redundancies as possible to get to the right dose? Use one of those milligram scoops, use a scale, and then play around with what one to two milligrams is, play around with what three to four is, play around with what four to five is, play around with what six milligrams is. But as soon as you get to those like above five, that's where you're going into the more psychoactive activity. And that's where it's like, you absolutely need to create that space for yourself. It's just a different level of intensity when you're getting above five milligrams. Then play around with like, play around a lot more in those that middle dose, because actually in that clinical trial, a six milligram was more challenging than a 12 or 18 milligram. But the six milligram is where you get that visceral experience of like, how do I let go? How do I trust? How do I understand the fear and anything that bubbles up and say, okay, I'm safe. So the, I think it's just, it's just such a precious opportunity before you've done a full release to just play around with those low doses. And then once you're ready and your nervous system has learned how to feel safe in those middle struggle doses, then once again, this is at home. If you choose to do it at home, then, then you go and have your full experience. And it's, I think it's just really important because I could speak to this clinical trial briefly, but they found that 100% of the participants who did the escalating dose had a peak experience, whereas those who just only started off with an 18 milligram, only I think half of them had a peak experience. So it's not even about the dose. It's about the process. It's about the stepwise escalation that provides that trust in the body, the psyche, the spirit, whatever you call it, to say, yes, I'm willing to let go and surrender. So that's how I would approach it if I were at home. But uh, once again, it's like, hey, well, come to toad school. Or maybe if enough people are interested I'm a nomad, so I'd love to go traveling and uh, meet you where you're at. Or maybe order a toad school in a box. <laughs> exactly. Or we'll do like um, like Zoom calls on all of the all of the parts. So it's just so many ways that I, I can see toad school evolving. A quick question about the dosing there. You mentioned eight, you mentioned this clinical trial and you mentioned it sounds like the therapeutic dose they were using was did you say 18 milligrams? They they decided to test. They used two milligrams as a control and they did six milligrams, 12 milligrams, and then 18 milligrams. They either did that as just like a one-time dose. So that was one arm. So like four people would get two milligrams, four people would get six, four people would get 12, four people would get 18. And then there was, I think it was either four or six people who got the six, 12, and 18. And all of those people had a peak experience. They didn't all have to go to 18. If they had a peak experience at six, they stopped there. If they had a peak experience at 12, they stopped there. If they had a peak experience at 18, well then, they, but they all had it. One person had one at six. I think two people had it at 12. And then the last person had it at 18. So the, whereas once again, the other arm where the people at 18, only two people, actually not even, I think one person had a peak experience at 18. So it's not about the dose. And I actually believe that you can get a peak experience at lower doses, that those were the doses they chose. So I think that that's going to then be protocolized into clinical practice. But I actually think my protocol is two milligrams, then usually anywhere between four and six, but I like to keep like, actually, I like to go much more gentle now. I like to go four milligram and then maybe a second hug. So the first dose is a handshake, two milligram. The second dose is four to six milligrams, which is a hug. And I can even do a second hug so that we get really get that nervous system trusting and regulating. So maybe four milligrams the first time, five milligrams the next time. And then the last dose is anywhere between eight milligrams, usually maximum 10. But if I notice that there's something blocking, I might go as high as 12. But I think you can get a peak experience that you don't have to go as high as 18. I think that when you get above 15, there's a much higher chance of dysregulation, having a lot of whiteout experiences, which is 
it kind of might feel like a coma where you've lost full sense, like lost track of time. And that can, once again, it's like the narrator is gone, the observer is gone. And so like what just happened can be a little like nerve wracking for some people. So if you're going above 15, there's a much higher probability of getting to that dose, which we're, I think that we, in my opinion, in my honest like belief and belief is that I think the observer needs to be there to, to witness the, to the, the non, I don't even know how to word it, but the observer needs to be there to witness the Samadhi consciousness. And I hope you all understand the, we can term it as peak experience, the universal consciousness, the oneness, the non-dual state. You need, I, I think that's important that the observer is there for that. So that's why I usually go gentle. And so once again, that trial that did 18, I would, I would then, you can always go lower and, and dial it up. But once again, if you dial it up, it's much harder to dial it back down. So I, I speaking to everyone out there who might be interested in trying it, yeah, just go gentle. And there's always more, more opportunities to, to dial it up more, but yeah, it's uh, going gentle is, is the key. We don't have to be cowboys. Cowboys isn't even the negative term. We don't have to ignore the, the fear is going to, you're, it's good to then sit comfortably in that discomfort, uncomfortable low doses, but that's speaking to a lot more experience than perhaps your viewers or listeners are aware of. Yeah, no, but that's great though. Thanks for going a little bit more into that. So I wanted to maybe pivot a little bit now from talking about Toad School and talking about your five experience and five in particular, and maybe starting to just chat a little bit about another piece of work that you do, which is obviously related to this, but has to do more with your background as a pharmacist. And so, mm-hmm. well, well, people will know this from the intro, but you also go by the name, the Dharmacist. And yeah. it's a play on the fact that you, yeah, are, you know, we're a practicing pharmacist. And so you've got this background. And as part of that, you are a pharmaceutical pharmaceutical consultant. And so you do offer consulting services for people that are maybe curious about for which I'm sure most commonly has been people that are working with psychedelics or working with people that are working with psychedelics and wondering, hey, like, is this medication that I'm taking going to interact with 5-MeO or is this medication going to interact with this other psychedelic? And so I'm curious to just hear a little bit more about that from you. Like, what has it been like being a pharmaceutical consultant, assuming that you identify with that label? And yeah, how has the role evolved with more people starting to use psychedelics more and more? Yeah, well, thanks for asking, Michael. Uh, I, well, first off, I want to say I think that earth medicines are safe, psychedelics are safe. And it's then it's about, I'm so glad that people then do their due diligence to create that, that container of safety. So we, I, and it's unfortunate that most people who actually would take most advantage of these healing, uh, these healing psychedelics, they, they, there's an interaction there. And so it blocks that, that like ability of like, oh, I could just take it and have a journey and then I could probably just continue the med. Yes, there are interactions oftentimes. And the most common interaction is actually like a blunting of the experience. There's a lot of misinformation out there that I hopefully with a few other experts in the field are clearing away. But I understand why the, the medical regular mainstream community will just say stay away because of liability issues right so I guess I'm I am the once again the outlier who is yeah I'm gonna have a conversation with people about hey, how do we have this how do we have your experience safe because my I believe that people are gonna go out and have these experiences anyways a lot of them so why don't I at least prepare them for a most likely a muted experience if there if there is an interaction there how do we try to mitigate that muting and or potentially deleterious effects if you add on something that with an MAOI or something that blocks the breakdown of the molecule so i've i've been so honored to have the trust of many therapists to call on me and they'll we'll book an appointment and we'll go through like all of the meds all the medical conditions we really create a care like we like bring in the care team, we make a plan for that person or bring that person in. And then we, we plan out like, how do we make sure that the journey that they have is the one that we, they are to receive minus any interactions. And then the other thing is that my, what I do love 
most is actually, I still get access to now, I call them journeyers. I get to talk to people who are like really, really excited to have an experience. And then I get to be part of their team and be on their side and support them and help them feel like, yes, someone's listening. Like people are going through these tough times who are looking for another modality of supporting them. It's just nice to know that, hey, I've got my person who's serving me the medicine. And I also have another pharmacist and I have more people who are here to support me in my journey. And I think that really adds to the care that they feel when they're doing an experience because they don't have to feel like they're alone. They, they have yeah, support. So I, I get to chat with them for like sometimes even an hour and we, we manage expectations. We chat about what, what like each experience can feel like. And so I get to be part of the, the care team. So it's been, it's been really fun. And I also just feel so rewarded because I do this all once again on donation. And there are people there who just say, you know, they wouldn't have known or they wouldn't have had access or they wouldn't have gotten the experience that they could have had it not been for the donation model. And yeah, if I can like speak to that is the donation model is I, I learned the donation model from Vipassana. If anyone's gone to Vipassana, they they will house you, they will teach you the meditation practice, they will feed you delicious, mostly organic food that are that's home cooked. And they ask nothing from you. They say, just come. And then they, they say at the end, if you had a, a wonderful experience and you want to share this with others, then donate. And if you don't, then that's fine too, because you learned the, the methodology. So I, and the person who started the Vipassana that we know, his name is Essen Goenka. He's passed away now. But when he, when he started to bring out this idea of it's going to be by donation, everyone scoffed. They were like, no, like, how are we going to fund everything? It's, it's not going to happen. It's like, it's going to like destroy us. And actually, since then, Vipassana has grown to hundreds of centers around the world and more people share it and more people have access. And so it just, it just speaks to, you know, at first when I was thinking about doing consult- consultations, I was like, how much would I ask for? I don't know. And then, and then of course, my, my partner was like, just do donation. And I have once again, receive like smiles and such gratitude and thank you. And like, you're going to be connected with me forever. And they continue to see how they can support me because they wouldn't have had that access to people who believe in like, wow, I really love what you're doing. And they, they go above the ceiling I would have created for myself. So I just have to trust in what's, what has, what has worked for other models that I've believed in. And so that's, that's been my consulting services. And that's been, once again, just like the application of Donna has been such a surprise and gift for, for me because otherwise, yeah, we're here to provide safety for others. And it's, it is, I like, I trust that like, yeah, without the service that, uh, yeah, people, it would have been a very different world. It would have been really different out there for others for yeah, my had it not been some of the times that I've helped them through their, their experience. But, ooh, you know, sometimes you like you talk so much and you're like, oh, I'm kind of tired of, of talking about myself. So I'm getting, I'm like, oh, okay. I can ask you another Hi, everyone. <laughs> okay. Whew. Thank you. Thanks for, for listening, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like it's been a rewarding thing for you to do. I, I love that you've been able to transform like what you have traditionally done or like at least what you went to school for and what you what you did for 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 a few years there like I'm, I'm glad to hear that you've you know been able to use those skills in a way that makes you feel fulfilled it sounds like those connections that you've made with people have been really powerful and yeah it just feels very heartfelt to hear your hear you just speak about the model and like how what it means to you and yeah relating it to Vipassana is super interesting as well noting that yeah that's a pretty popular approach now a lot more people are going to Vipassana retreats and like you say they probably yeah. wouldn't be able to access it without that model so that's really great I want to be mindful of time there's lots of kind of questions that came up there with me to ask you further but I just want to maybe just focus on one and you don't have to go into all of the you know details of it but maybe if you're open to just providing a little bit of a summary of your kind of a your perspective on this I'd be curious to know since it is such a common thing and I'm sure it's probably the most common like query that you get 
as a pharmaceutical consultant, and that is like, what is your opinion on combining SSRIs with classic psychedelics? There's like, luckily I get to draw on science now. I'm, I'm so glad that the war on drugs is pretty much over. I'm actually I even like, basically you can make cinnamon psychedelic but yeah anyway we can speak about that at another time but yeah the there's now studies out there and I'm so glad because yeah when you suppress you suppress the molecule you suppress the science but now there's all these journals and studies out there that are sharing that what we know based on let's see the answer is serotonin syndrome is no longer a concern for when you're mixing your, your like MDMA and your psilocybin. It's just that you're going to have a muted effect. And with MDMA more so because it completely just blocks the effects of MDMA. Whereas with psilocybin, it's a little bit of a, a mixed bag of how it's interacting. So with MDMA, it's you're pretty much gonna have a muted effect. And with psilocybin, the study that recently came out that was an observational trial but at least it's like, hey, it's data. It's that people are asking, what did you do when, what happened to you when you have an SSRI or SNI on board, SNRI on board, and you took psilocybin? Whether you remember what a three gram dose was before, for example, and what a three gram dose was when you're on the, on the, onto the SSRI or SNRI, or whether you had the same dose as friends and they seem to have a much different response than you. Like, so those were, those were the two major questions. And so in the, in the most part, when you're mixing an, SSRI or SNRI with psilocybin, about 50% of the time you're going to get a muted effect. So then there's different ways to approach what do you do then. So, but that's just the plain straight answer of it. Thank you. That's perfect. I wanted to ask you now, you know, what is one thing that you wish more people knew about 5-MeO? I wish they knew that 5-MeO, even though it's been touted as the most profound and intense medicine out there, it's, it's, it has so many different layers to it. So the low dose, which I, micro, my, I did for 30 days straight, it's just like meditation in a bottle to me. So it's, it's just got this, it's beautiful, it's embodied, it's you just, just a nice little like hum or this nice like a nice like hug. It's like one of those weighted blankets on you. And the middle dose is going to bring out so many lessons for you. It's, it's powerful on its own. And then the, the high dose is the one that is shared mostly among, among people online. You know, the, the Mike Tysons and the Joe Rogans, they all talk about the, the peak experience, but there's just so many different ways to offer the medicine and I am insufflated, IV as well, per rectum as well. So there's just, in every single way, modality has a different, different experience to it. So I think that if you think that it might be a little too scary for you, you don't have to go all the way. There's, there's a lesson in every dose and there's a lesson in every, with every modality too. So I think that it's just really, it's such a beautiful molecule that we still have that we still have more science to catch up on. But I've seen it work with addictions. I've seen it work with PTSD, anxiety, depression, OCD. I mean, I'm not saying it's going to cure it, but I have seen cases where it's, it's been night and day for those individuals. So it's it's your own experience. It's going to be the medicine is going to as we all hear and, and know well, the medicine is going to provide you what it will, what it's meant to provide you. But I, I think there is so much potential in this molecule and I'm glad that research is starting to catch up. And I think that we need more people out there because if we know it is incredibly healing and can help other people, I just think we need more people to know how to surf it. So there we go. I have two messages for, for everyone. That's wonderful. I love the piece there that you said about the different layers. I think that is really important because typically all the headlines you see about five are like the most potent psychedelic ever or whatever. Mm. So yeah, that's really important to mention that. Speaking about potential, I wanted to ask you if everything goes according to plan, where where do you see yourself in 10 years and maybe where do you see Toad School in 10 years? 
when someone tells me that I hope my job becomes like canceled, like not canceled in the new term, but like if it's like there's no need for me anymore, it's like that means I've done my job. So if if everyone knows how to, if if like if Five Mio, my dream is Five Mio is being widespreadly used as possibly even like you know how you go to the spa to get like a good pick me up, like a tune up in a way. It's like the whole people can go and it's as widespread as that. It's like, oh, I need a, maybe like, a, there's just some lesson out there or there's like a spiritual something out there for me or what, whatever it is, for whatever reason you're choosing to use it. It's like, it's as widespread as that, it's safe. There's even another way of offering that's even hot outside of my realm of possibilities that's even safer. Like maybe adding different roots of administration in combination with the escalating doses. I don't know. So I, I think that my perfect 10 year mark would be, it's out there already. Everyone knows how to offer it safely. It's continuing to evolve way beyond even like, I'll be like, you know, like, you know how like people are like, how do you use these darn iPhones? You know, like I'll be, I'll feel so prehistoric because I'm so caught up on my 20, 20, two way of serving it that it's like well these these newcomers are just so advanced and I don't even know what they're doing anymore I feel like I hope it's like that and I hope that there's just so much more knowledge I hope that there's like gonna be a database of oh I'm taking this pharmaceutical product is this safe I mean I'm, I'm personally trying to build that now I'm trying to open source all of my work whenever I do a case I write down like I write down all the notes of how I did it and I'm trying to open source that I'm trying to figure out it's like as a new mom it's just really hard to find time but all these plans so but I do hope that it's going to people are going to have safe access to all psychedelics so a database where everyone can just type in their pharmaceuticals and they can figure out oh there's a there's an issue here I have someone to talk to I have a team of people I can talk to about what to what to do in this case and then once again 5MEO is this being widespread shared with, with everyone who chooses to work with this medicine. Amazing. That's a bright future. <laughs> yeah. And then we'll all be, and then we'll all be so much more realigned. Yeah. I'm, I, in Toad School one, I didn't talk about this, but like, have you heard of Maslow's hierarchy and that it was borrowed from the Blackfoot tribe? I didn't know that it was borrowed from them. Yeah. He I lived with the, he, he lived with the Blackfeet for about six weeks or more. And he learned about how it's like, wait, how is everyone here actualized? He's like, my own community is like five to 10% of people are actualized and almost everyone here is actualized. And so he tried to figure out what it was and uh, he, he came up with his, his model, but like in, in the purposes of like trying to expedite time, I almost don't, almost don't want to, but I think we should all, look, everyone should look it up. I can send links to like learn more about it. But the Blackfeet, they all believe you're already actualized. You're already, you're already divine. And our gifts, our, our, our purpose in life is to share our divine gift with the world. Mm -hmm. And then the community actualization is just like an added layer to it is the community is there to support you in providing your divine gift to the world. And then the last rung for them or the top of the TP is it's cultural perpetuity is you're here because of some, it's in another way of saying it, it's like you're here because of seven generations before you and you are, all of your actions and considerations should be in service of seven generations in the future. So it's that this, just think about like, wow, if we actually were given the financial, the care, the space, the support to share our divine gifts with the world, our world would be so different. It just feels actually the opposite of that. It feels like we're given the opposite. We're to have no support. We are busy so nine to 10 hours a day doing something else we don't believe in for a lot of people that we don't have the time or energy or resources to do, to do our own divine offering. And I think that if I might speak to, I think that the five has us wake up to that. It, it really does offer an insight into like another, another vantage point of like, oh, what is, what am I here to offer? What is my divine purpose? 
I think all psychedelics have that actually that insight offering. So I'll, I'll speak to all of those, but I think that there's a, there's just this, I've been working with that model a lot. And so that is where all now of my, everything I do is in consideration of seven generations of the future. So I'm all of my action, my open sourcing, that's because I hope that it's probably gonna be after my lifetime, you know, you said in 10 years time, but I think that my wish is probably gonna be beyond my lifetime is yeah, we're gonna have safe access to these psychedelics and it's gonna be available to everyone from all different walks of life. So that's, that's my wish for, for the future. That's a beautiful wish. Thank you so much for sharing it, Trina. And thanks for all your work that you've done with Toad School to help people move up on that hierarchy of needs. And yeah, it's been a beautiful conversation to have with you today. I think that's a, be- a great place to, to maybe end and, and to wrap up. I invite you to share maybe any last thought that you might have or anything that you maybe haven't gotten to share on this episode today that you, you really wanted to maybe end on and maybe share also where people can best find you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's important. If I, I always, you know, I'm, I'm combining the learnings from two really great people I've met. And I think, I think I can contribute this to Chris Bacchus, the gentleman who wrote the, the LSD journeys. Uh, Beige. His, Beige, yes. Beige. He said to, to, to trust your footsteps. And I, and then I have another mentor who told me to follow my feet. So now I've added both of them and I say, you know, trust your footsteps. You're here because of all of your wisdom and all of your learning and all of your mistakes and all the things you think, oh, why did I do that? Right. But just trust that everything you've gathered from all of these learnings is there to guide you into your next steps. And it's important that we do follow our feet. Sometimes we just got to let go of this head and just let our feet do the moving, you know? So I, I think that's how, that's just how Toad School happened. That's how all of what is now happened is because I just, just followed my heart and my feet and didn't think about, well, what are they going to say? Or how am I going to do this? Or who am I going to, who am I to do all of this? Like, a little bit of that fear, that impersonator fear, but it's just like we we gotta just do. Let's just let's just all. If it's in service of others, I hope that we have find the courage to do. And if anyone wants to find more information about myself, consultation, or Toad School, then they can find it on thedarmacist.com. So instead of the pharmacist, it's the dharmacist. <laughs> Okay, beautiful. Wow. Well, thanks again, Trina, so much for this wonderful conversation. I really hope that we have the chance to do a follow-up. I feel like there's so many little avenues that we could have (laughs) dove in deeper into. So I hope that we get the opportunity to do that not too far in the future. And I'm really excited to witness your vision and your dream unfold for the future of this medicine in particular, and just like the psychedelic space as a whole, you're doing such great, awesome work in the space. And it's really awesome to, to know you and to have been able to witness that grow. So thanks for sharing that with the Flying Sage community today. And but yeah, looking forward to seeing you at another mm-hmm. Toad School event. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or a Flying Sage event. A Flying Sage event. And, uh, yeah, thank you, Michael. I don't even know that, like, how do you keep adding on offerings to, to the Flying Sage? It's just like, it's just amazing. I, you are truly following, you're trusting your footsteps and following your feet. So thank you for being such a beacon of, light and hope and magic into our into our spaces into our community so thank you thanks trina okay take care and talk soon take care thanks so much for listening today if you enjoyed this episode please consider taking a deep breath becoming present and then leaving a review or sharing it with your friends it really helps us get the podcast out to more people If you would like to stay tuned to future updates with The Flying Sage, make sure to head on to our website and sign up for our email newsletter. You can also follow us on Instagram as well. If you are interested in getting more involved with The Flying Sage, please head to our website where you can learn about all the different ways to get involved. We're looking forward to having you tune in to our next episode, and until then, wishing you blessings and love.